But today, I believe I have a prophetic word for the house. I had a great 3.5 point message for you, and it's just, it was awesome. It had a great title, and it was great. And God said, I'd like you to say this today. So I'm going to release something that's going to be more of a prophetic message. And let me tell you something. We get a lot of meat in this house. You get some amazing word in this house. And if, if you ever wonder, you can go back and listen. The, the, the depth of the word of God that gets preached from this pulpit is, is second to none. And I encourage you, I never get everything out of a message when I listen to it once. You know, the, the Bible says we're supposed to meditate on the word of God. And that means we need to go back and we need to revisit and we need to re-listen because our little human ears and our little brain does not capture all of the revelation the first time. So it's very important that we are allowing the word of God to get in us more than one time when something is being preached in the house. But like I said, I love this house. I love being a part of the house of God. I'm a builder of the house. And this morning, I, I want to encourage you to give the Holy Spirit permission to reignite something on the inside of you to be a house builder. See, we've been distanced for several months, and I know a lot of a lot of us have come back to the house, and, and some of you are watching online, and you can't come back to the physical building. And that's okay, because the house isn't about a physical building. The house is about a state of your heart. The house is about a mindset. The house is, a, is about something that gets rooted and is passionate on the inside of you to build the kingdom of God and to build his house in the earth. Because his word says that we are moving, we are living stones. Every one of you in this room, every one of you watching today, you are a living stone. That means wherever you live, you are still a stone and you are part of the house that we are building in the earth for the Lord. Come on, say, I'm a living stone. Listen, I'm not okay like, like Pastor Lynn is for you to just sit there and quiet and take in. I, I am all about participation today. All right? So I need y'all to help me preach this message. This is not a spectator house. We are a participation house. Because the same Jesus that lives in me is the same Jesus that lives in you just because I have a microphone in my hand today. There's no difference. But I believe there's a revelation that God's going to release today. I don't know how many of you were here last time I got to share. I talked about um, who's at your table. Does anybody remember that moment? Who's at your table? Can I, just when I start, can I do a little checkup? How many people have you made room for at your table in the last 60 days? It's quiet up in here. I say that to myself too. Maybe your table has to be over Zoom right now. I don't know. You still have a table because a table is where conversation happens. A table is where life is shared. A table is where we get to know one another rather than some sort of an idea of who you are. That's how we get to know one another. That's how we break down racial walls as we sit at a table. There's no table on Facebook. There's no table on those things. I've really taken myself off of that for like the last 60 days, except for sharing church on Sunday. Because God was like, I I'm tired of you focusing on the wrong things. And you know, we've been, in a, we've been in a series that Pastor Lynn's been teaching about focus. And today, I believe this word is going to refocus some places in our lives. It's going to refocus us. Are you ready to be refocused? I want the Holy Spirit to come and help us to be all that we are designed to be. Come on, will you just close your eyes with me for a minute? Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this room. I know your presence is already here. As soon as we spoke your name, Jesus, you show up every time. And I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your goodness. Holy Spirit, I thank you that we get the privilege to stand in your presence. 
How humbling is that? That's greater than the presence of any great leader we would think on this earth, but we get to stand in the presence of the creator of the universe. We're so privileged today. And Holy Spirit, I ask you that you would give all of us in this room the bravery and the strength to give you permission to not stay the same in the next 30 minutes. God, that we would be transformed, that we would be refocused, that we would be realigned. God, I pray that my words are aligned with your voice today, not my voice. Because I know my voice can be pretty strong, and I try to over-talk you a lot, Lord, but today let me not do that. We love you. We love your house, God. We love you and we honor you and we worship you and and your first place today. Come on, just ask the Holy Spirit to block everything else out for the next 30 minutes so that you can hear his voice like you have not heard it in a long time. We give you permission, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the privilege that you call us sons and daughters. Amen. Just look at somebody next to you. If they're a girl, I know gender. Well, anyway, um, if they're a girl, I want you to say you're a daughter. And if they're a guy, I want you to say you're a son. Can you turn to somebody and point at them and say that? Point at somebody else. Remind them, hey, you're not just hired help. You're not a slave. You're not a servant. You're a daughter and you're a son. Because we're, when we are in the house of God, we are sons and daughters and mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. That's what family is. That's what a home is for. That's why God doesn't call this his institution. He calls it his house. And God's been taking me on a little adventure for the last few months. So as most of you know, um, Pastor Tim Fox uh, came on full time in March, just a few weeks before the entire world decided to shut down. And all of a sudden, Tim Fox did not just become my husband, but he became my boss, in a sense. Help me, Jesus. Now, the staff here still knows I'm the boss, but we let Tim think that because it's good for him. It builds his morale. It keeps him busy. But my world has significantly shifted because my role in the house I had to make room for my husband to have a role in the house. Thank you. Y'all know that I'm hot all the time. Thank you. I had to make room for him. So I've been on a little bit of an adventure of asking God, what are you doing? Hey, what you doing? Hey, God, what? I'm sorry. What are you thinking? I'm sorry. What's happening? Why is all this change coming? Why is all this shift coming? Where do I fit? Where do I belong? Where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing? Are you sure I'm supposed to be doing that? Are you sure I'm supposed to be doing this? So I've been on this little adventure. And about two weeks ago, we were in a service here. You know, worship is powerful. God's always talking in worship. If you're listening. If you're too busy focused on you don't like the style of music or you don't like this or that, then you probably don't hear his voice. But worship isn't about any of that. So I was in worship and God was just talking and he said, I'm ready for you to return. I'm like, return? What? (laughs) Where'd I go? (laughs) I'm still here. I haven't left. I haven't gone anywhere. He said, I'm ready for you to return. And so I, I just took that and thought, well, maybe God's, maybe I'm not hearing the right reword today. I don't know. But go, where does God think I've gone? I, I've laid my life down. I'm here every single week. I do everything I need to do. I'm trying to, to serve and, and, and I'm trying to help Tim feed all of Pensacola in 2.5 days every week. I, I, I'm trying to do everything I know to do. And God said to me again, I'm ready for you to return. And when my grandmother, uh, my 99-year-old grandmother in 
August, on my birthday, decided to go be with Jesus, there was a returning moment that happened on the inside of me. And I can't put that into words except to tell you I've been on an adventure. And how many of you know that the greatest opportunities come when you feel the greatest resistance? How many of you feel resistance right now in the world? If you don't feel resistance, I'm coming to live with you. Because my God, everywhere I turn, there's a lot of resistance. No matter what you believe, no matter what you feel, no matter what color your skin is, no matter what you look like, no matter how old you are, no matter if you're a, a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. There is great resistance right now. But I'm going to tell you again, the greatest opportunities are birthed from the moments of greatest resistance. So what you do with that resistance is what is going to produce an opportunity over your life. I told you I was going to get just a little prophetic today. Because there's opportunities hanging over us with what we do with the resistance. Now, I've never done resistance training. Oh, I'm going to share my password right now with somebody. Um, the greatest resistance, <laughs> I've never done resistance training, but I know some, how many of you have done resistance training? Well, God bless y'all. I have enough resistance and I feel like physical exercise should not be part of it. But there is something about when there's resistance, even if you don't have a weight, but there's just resistance, how much that strengthens your muscles. So let the resistance that the enemy is pushing in the world right now strengthen something on the inside of you. Let it strengthen something. Okay, back to returning. So sometimes God is taking us somewhere brand new, and those are the really fun times. When it's like, woo, God's doing something new. His mercies are new every morning. There's something brand new. I read the scripture of Isaiah. Something new is about to spring up in my life. And then there are moments and times when God says, I'm not doing something brand new. I'm refocusing you, and I want you to return to something. We all go through seasons and, and things in our life when we get disappointed. Anybody been disappointed? Where we get offended. Anybody been offended? Not as many hands. I know, there's some of you that aren't honest. It's okay. You're probably still offended. That's why you can't raise your hand. Circumstances don't look the way we want them to be. Somebody betrays you. You know that when Judas betrayed Jesus, he still called him friend. People assume because you don't respond to them on a social post that you're against them. That's not true. When Judas came and he sold Jesus out, the greatest betrayal of all betrayals. Excuse me, nobody sold you to have you killed, I don't think any time recently. You think you're dying, but it's nothing compared to what Jesus went through. When Judas came, Jesus said to him, Go ahead and do what you have to do, friend. But we get caught up in offenses and betrayals and circumstances and disappointments and all these things. And there's been a lot of that in 2020. My goodness. There's been a lot of that. And, and when that begins to happen in those times, in those vulnerable moments in your life, the enemy goes in overdrive. And he begins to work himself silly, building off ramps in your life so that you can exit off of the path of your destiny. And the enemy has been busy building some off ramps for some of you listening this morning. And I hope that in the spirit, we blow up some exit ramps today. 
I hope in the spirit that we just take some Holy Spirit dynamite and explode those things so that you can't exit out of the things that God has for you. See, some of you have been listening to voices. It's time to exit the marriage. It's time to exit the relationship. It's time to exit because they're white or they're black. It's time to exit out of the church right now. If we can't be all in and we can't be this, then I'll just hide behind this mask. No pun intended. It's time to exit out of, out of this thing or that thing. And that's the enemy lying to you. Let me speak it very clear to you. The enemy will speak loud and sometimes we will mistake his voice. I don't know if you remember when I told you uh, during our, our anniversary Sunday, um, the, the video, the first two minutes of that video or minute or so is my dad talking about who Jubilee is. And when they started playing it, I did not recognize his voice. Now that's crazy, because that's my dad. But I haven't been listening to his voice for about six years on purpose, because it just makes me sad. (laughs) But when you quit listening to the voice, you begin to not recognize it. So you got to know the voice and you got to be hearing his voice all the time or the enemy's voices will begin to make sense to you. And let me, let me just say this. I want to kill offense in the atmosphere today because offense is an event. Being offended is a choice. And, and you have to, offenses will come. The word says that. Offenses will come to you. There have been plenty of reasons to be offended in the last 90 days in our nation and in the world. Offenses will come. If you you end up offended, it's because you chose to be that way. I have to choose to not be offended. That's what Jesus said. Offenses will come, but you better act differently than everybody else, if you know me. That's what he says. So it's not an exit ramp season because God wants to build his church. That's what I said in the beginning. I'm a church builder. God wants to build his church in the earth and the enemy is too busy building exit ramps out of the church. And we've got to return to building the church instead of driving down the exit ramp. Now when I travel... If I'm ever driving, Tim can't stand a ride with me. That's a whole nother story. But I tend to get myself confused on interstates almost every time. I inevitably go the wrong direction. So I was leaving um, New Orleans about a year and a half ago or two years. Thanks, Will. Thank you. I just wanted a little flow for the moment. It's up to you. But I I was in, um, I was coming back from New Orleans, and I've been in New Orleans a gazillion times and I was coming back and I'm just talking 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 and I have my GPS on because I do not trust my directional abilities of any kind and so I was listening and it kept saying every time I would go by an exit it was like um uh you know exit take this exit take this exit and turn take this exit and turn I'm like what is wrong with this GPS Maybe I left in Popeye's chicken or something. I don't know. But I'm not, I, I'm headed home. I don't need that. And literally for about 30 miles, it kept every, and finally I just silenced it. I'm like, this crazy GPS is just off. And then I realized the whole time I was going the wrong direction. And that little GPS was like, hey, you little crazy girl, you are going the wrong way. Do you know that's what God does with us? He's like, he's like, hey, get off here. Turn around. I need you to return back the other way. Somebody shout return. If I could title this message anything today, I'm going to call it Welcome Home. Welcome back. Oh, sorry, that's an old show. I just dated myself. Welcome home. Come on, high five, oh, well, elbow somebody and say, say, welcome home. 
Thank you. If you high five, I'm so proud of you. Good job. Welcome home. Listen, God doesn't want any of us to waste the years that we have invested in life and in relationships and in his house and in his kingdom. Everything you've invested is for a purpose. And instead of exiting today, God wants you to turn around and go back and get refocused and back on track. Where do, where do I need to return? Revelation 2, verses 4 and 5, and you can, you can throw that up there. Um, in Revelation, I'm reading out of the Passion Translation. It's a great translation. But I have this against you now. Now, <laughs> Jesus is talking to the church here, and they call it the loveless church, the church that lost their love. The church that got about their own selfish pride, like we just sang about a minute ago. And the church that forgot to love God and love others. And he says, I have this against you. I don't know about you, I do not want Jesus to have anything against me. I feel like that's not a good place to be. I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love that you had for me at the beginning. We are so caught up in everything else except the passionate love we had for Jesus in the very beginning. That's a place we need to return. So y'all know I'm a big Disney fan, right? So I uh, haven't, I did go to Disney one time in a mask. I don't think I'll do it again. Just going to tell you that. It was intense. It was really hot. I couldn't breathe. There were no lines. Otherwise, it was not a good experience, all right? But I'm a big Disney fan, and Tim and I are part of a, a, um, a home share thing called Disney Vacation Club. And Tim wishes we weren't because he thinks I think there is nowhere else to vacation except Orlando. But I, I do believe there are other places to vacation. I just, as my dad used to say, I, I made my great Mecca once a year to the Rat Palace. So... So Disney Vacation Club, you stay at what they call their home resorts, which we like because we paid this off a while back, so now it's pretty much free for us when we use our points, which is awesome. And so when we go there, I wish I would have brought my big Mickey hand, but they're always standing, and as soon as you pull up, the first thing they say to you is, welcome home. I'm like, this isn't home. This is a resort where everything's clean and taken care of and already paid for. And there's no dirty laundry, and there's no dirty dishes in the sink, and, and the lawn is manicured, and the pool is perfect, Tim. Sorry, I just had to throw that in there. He is struggling after Hurricane Sally. Our pool is very green. Can anybody relate right now? Help me, Jesus. But when we pull up, they're like, welcome home, and they just wave to you, and we're like, oh, thank you. Yeah, welcome home, hey. You know why? Because they want you from the very beginning to feel like you belong there. They want you to feel like no matter where you came from, no matter what your background is, you may live in, in, a, in a little bitty shack somewhere, but when you, when you come here, we want you to feel like this is home for you. Do you know that's how God wants us to feel about his house? When you walk in the doors or you log on to the live stream, whatever it is, this is your house. Say, this is my house. If it's not your house, then I want it to be your house, so just say it by faith. This is my house. And you know, home and house has a lot of meanings, right? Home is the place maybe you permanently live. As a member of a family, home has the meaning of where a sports team plays on their own field. Home has the meaning of when you're on the computer and you're on a, a software or a website, you go back to the what page? Oh, the home page, the home screen. You know why? Because everything foundational is at, at the home page. Wherever you need to navigate on the rest of that site can be found on the home page. And the house of God is no different. This is a foundational part of who you are as serving Christ and living and working in his kingdom. 
Some of you, when I mention house or home, it does not have that warm, inviting feeling for you. You don't think home seems stressful. Home might be a bad word to you. I don't know. God wants to return something and refocus you on what a real home is. Psalm 26, 8 says this, Lord, I love your home, this place of dazzling glory, bathed in the splendor and the light of your presence. Psalm 27, 4 says, here's the one thing I crave from God. The one thing I seek above all else. I want the privilege of living with him every moment in his house. Finding the sweet loveliness of his face, filled with awe, delighting in the glory and the grace. I want to live my life so close to him that he takes pleasure in every one of my prayers. I want to live, I crave to live in the house of God. Because the house of God is a place of safety. The house of God is a place of protection. The house of God is a place of belonging. The house of God is a place of his presence. And I make no apology today that the lie the enemy has been saying to some of you is that you don't belong, that you don't need the church, that you don't need a house, that you don't need a community. It's an exit ramp today. That you're too far gone, that you're lost, you're distant, you've messed up, you're not worthy enough, you don't deserve it enough, you don't care enough. God is calling you home today. He wants you to return to your passionate love you had in the very beginning and return to this place called home. Psalm 23 that I spoke out of last time about the table, it says, you prepared me a table in the presence of my enemies. And then the last verse of Psalm 23 says, your beauty and your love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. So you understand in Psalm 23, he talks about going through the valley of the shadow of death. He talks about going on all this, this roller coaster of a world that he's prepared you a table in the presence of your enemies and all these crazy places. But at the end, he says, but I'm back home in the house of the Lord. You know where people go on holidays? Back home. You know where people go when they've been away for a long time? Back home. I know a little bit about this journey because I have been in church my entire life. I have been in this church almost my whole life. Tim and I lived away from here for about six or seven years, and, and we served in, under other pastors and under other houses, homes. And I know a little bit about that, that there are times that I've been offended, and I've been disappointed, and I've been hurt by the church or people in the church, that, that I've, I've had to walk through crazy situations in my life and awkward moments and very sick moments and, and very all these crazy moments, but every time I find myself returning back to the house over and over and over. You know why? Because I choose to believe that God's best choice for me is to never do life alone. That is the danger of quarantine. Because there has been so much isolation released in this earth right now. God is not the author of isolation. Now I'm not saying we don't distance for safety. Don't, don't misquote me. Don't put it in the comments. But isolation is not God's plan. He did not, he did not design us to do life alone. We need a family. We need a connection. Remember I said you are a living stone. Have you ever seen a, a building of bricks or stones and it's only built with three? Or there's only one? No. No. We are living stones, and we're supposed to be building the house of God. It says you are that living stone. You are designed to flourish where you are planted. Matthew 16, 18 says this. He was talking to Peter, and he changed his name, and he called him Peter, which means rock. And he said, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
That means all hell that has broken loose in this earth right now will still not stop the house of God and the church being built in the earth. We just have to return to building. We are so busy trying to prop up things. I was driving down airport today and all the trees in front of Sandy Sansing and all those, you know, every single one of those cute little trees fell over. Like every one. It was like dominoes. They were all just over from the hurricane. And today when I drove by, they have braced them all up with wood. Did anybody see that today? The, all those trees have been stood, they've stood them back up and they have wood braces so that they will reroot and stand back up. See, we've been so busy letting everything just fall and lay on the ground, and we've forgotten we're supposed to be rebuilding. There's no better time after a hurricane. Would you like them to rebuild the bridge? Come on, somebody. What a mess is that? We are missing parts of our bridge. We can't get to Gulf Breeze without a 90-minute drive. I told Tim yesterday I'm such a beach fan, and I was like, I want to go to the beach. And he's like, we don't have three hours today to get to the beach and back, babe. I was like, ugh. You know why? Because something was left untied and unsecured, and it wasn't, didn't have the foundation it needed, so it broke loose, and it busted things, and it broke things, and it damaged things. And that's what's been happening all in the earth in the last several months. There are, there are open barges that the enemy has released and they're causing damage here and there and everywhere. And we're just letting the damage stay. I said to Tim the other day, I'm like, that barge is still up under the bridge. When are they going to move that? When are they going to start working? And I heard God say, when are you going to start working? And he wasn't talking about the three-mile bridge. He was talking about the house of God. He was talking about, Angela, you've just been in your little bubble, living your life. And I need you to return back to a builder, a building, a building place. I need you to pick back up your tools. I need you to pick back up your weapons. Does that mean that I haven't been doing all that God wants me to do? No, I've been, I've been doing good things. And God's like, those are, those are good things. But that's not going to fix the bridge. All right, I got to move on. I got I to gotta wrap this up. I'm sorry, y'all. Listen, the enemy's been lying to some of you that you don't need the church. But I'm telling you, God's about to build the church, and he's going to do it with you, and he's going to do it with me. And it's time for you to be bold enough to pick your seat back up and take your place in the house of God. And if you can't come in physically to the house, you still can take your place right where you are. Because God doesn't have social distancing. His house doesn't have social distancing because he lives in us. We are the temple. We are a house. We are the church. Tim said it earlier. We are the church. So I'm not talking about coming and helping us redo the metal that got ripped off the building, although if that's your thing, you can come do it. But I'm talking about building the house of God, which is people. People. People are our greatest resource, not money, not a building, not great technology, although that's awesome. God's greatest resource of people. That's, that's why he sent his son and he died for us. He didn't die for a building. He died for us. Let me end with this story because I'm, I'm way off time. I made a choice to plant myself. Somebody say, plant yourself. Sometimes we just have to plant ourselves in the house, even when it's uncomfortable even when it's uncomfortable. Turn with me quickly to Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to wrap it up with this story, all right? Very familiar story. And I believe these two types of people are listening online or sitting in the room today. 
Familiar story of two brothers in Luke 15. How many of you know this story? How many of you have heard this story preached? How many of you have read this story? How many of you know this story? I love this whole chapter in Luke 15 because basically everyone was judging Jesus saying, why do you hang out with crazy people and thieves and prostitutes and why do you hang out with all these people? And then he, all he did was give them three stories in this whole chapter. I love it. He's like, I'm not going to answer you directly. I'm just going to give you three stories and I want you to figure it out. But which one of these brothers is more like you? The prodigal? The lost son? The one who left, the one who, who lost everything because he went and he made a choice that he wanted to go live his dream. He wanted to go live his best life. He wanted his inheritance right now. Things I want to do for myself. I want to go have a good time. I want to go right now. I want to live life up while I can. I want to go pursue my dreams. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And it's not going to happen here because this house is confining. I want to go, and there, there can't be anything else for me here. It's got to be somewhere else. Even before all the turmoil and, and the crazy isolation that we've been in, some of you have taken your place somewhere else. I've taken everything from here, and then I walked away, and I went and did what I wanted with it. And now maybe you think nobody wants me in the house. My past has made it impossible for me to come back to the house. For those of you that walked away and you're sitting in this room because you came back, well done. That you did not allow shame and pride to keep you from the house. Because there are no stipulations in God's house. Then there was the older brother, the been there, done that guy. That's me. I'm the older brother. Actually, my brother is my older brother, but you know what I'm saying. I'm the older brother. I've served. I've worked. I've stuck it out. I knew what to do. I've been reliable. I've done it. I've, I, I've stayed here. I didn't leave when everybody else left. I didn't get crazy when everybody else went crazy. I didn't, I, 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 I'm still here. And if you ask me to come up and feed hot meals, I'll, I'll come up and work for Tim Fox like we all do every single day. Or if you want me to come give out produce boxes, I'll come up. Or if you want me to come help clear the playground, or if you want me to come help cook meals for people, or if you want me to come and rearrange the chairs in the auditorium, I'll come do that. That's what I did about two weeks ago. I don't, even know if, I don't even know if Craig or anybody knows, but I moved everything forward by two full rows. I moved the camera stands and everything. Nobody was in here. I was scared to death something wasn't going to work, and they were going to be like, what happened? I'd be like, I don't know. I don't know. I felt too far away from the people, so I moved y'all closer. The sound isn't as good up here in the altar, but, but you know what? That was the older brother. When everybody else left, I stayed. Some of you in this room feel like that. But now, my reliability has turned into an attitude that says I've seen it all and I've done it all. And nothing makes me excited anymore to show up. Even though I stayed at the house, hit my excitement left, my passion left, my purpose was lost while I stayed. Because it's just the church. It's just the house of God. So I roll in late and I leave early and I'm on my phone the whole time Lynn's preaching. And I've got other things that I think are better and more important, but I'm here. Which one are you? I'm sorry, y'all. I know that Lynn is so much nicer. Let me tell you something. Whichever one you are, the Father is for you. I already told on myself, I'm the older brother. That's why God said I was complaining a little bit. Like, I, I've stuck it out, and now I'm, what? And he's like, yeah, you need to return to the party because you forgot to celebrate the things that I celebrate. Let's just read the story really quick. Luke 15, verse 11. 
Can you throw that up there? Thanks. When Jesus said, once there was a father with two sons, the younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me the share of your estate that belongs to me? So the father went ahead and distributed among the two sons their inheritance. Now, who got inheritance? Both sons. He didn't just give money to the lost son. He gave it to both of them. They both could do whatever they wanted. Shortly afterward, the younger son packed up all his belongings, traveled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far-off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. With everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry, for there was a severe famine in the land. Let me tell you something. If you go and take the exit ramp, you eventually will run out of road. So he begged a farmer in that country to hire him, and the farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. The son was so famished, he was willing to even eat the slop that was given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. It's feast or famine, people. Humiliated, the son finally realized what he was doing, and he thought, there are many workers at my father's house who have all the food that they want. With plenty to spare, they lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? Good for him. He did not let his pride keep him in the pigsty. Do you know how many people are not sitting in this room today because of pride? We just sang it. God, help me lose my selfish pride. That's easy to sing, but that's hard to do. It was really pretty when Jessica was singing it. Lord, help me lose my selfish pride. Selfish pride is ugly. You should be ugly crying when you're singing that. But this, this kid right here, he knew he lost it all. He knew he messed up. Living his best life. Now he's with the pigs. And he's like, my God, I would be better off to be a servant in my dad's house. Maybe my dad will just, he was thinking about his bedroom. He was thinking about the, the, the person who prepared the food there. He was thinking about a closet full of clothes. That's what I would be thinking about. He said, I want to go back home to my father's house. And then he began to prepare a speech so that he would get his, convince his father to let him come home. I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong i sinned against you. So he prepared the apology speech. I'll never be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the young man set off for home from a long distance away. His father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar, and great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was, what? Returning home. So the father raced out to meet him. He swept him up in his arms. He hugged him dearly, and he kissed him over and over and over. That's how the father feels about us when we mess up. He runs to meet you. We just sang it. Shout out his name, and he will run to where you are. Then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I've sinned against you. He started his speech. Here he was. Okay, I prepared. I practiced. I said it over and over. I tried to make sure all my words. It's like the text that you retype five times or ten times. Oh, I better not say it that way. Oh, I better not say it that way. I could have never deserved to be called your son. Just let me be. The father interrupted and said, Son, you're home now. I hear the Spirit of God saying that over some of you in the room and some of you that may listen to this, you may listen to this at a later time. But I hear God saying, if you will come home, the Father will run to meet you. And I will speak as a pastor of this house. If you come home to this house, you will be home. There are words hanging over this house that prodigals will come home. So how dare we judge the prodigal?
Turning to his servants, the father said, Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring me the ring. Bring me the seal of sonship. And I will put it on his finger. That's what the ring represented. It represented that you're not a servant, you're a son. And bring out the best shoes. That's my favorite part. You can find for my son. I have a shoe fetish, y'all. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For this beloved son of mine was once dead, but he's alive again. Now, he never died. Did he die? Did the lost son die? No. But there was a resurrection in that house that day. Once he was lost, but now he is found, and everyone celebrated except one person. Now, Angela, I mean, the older son was out working in the field when his brother returned. And as he approached the house, he heard the music of celebration and dancing. Now, can you imagine this? All right, you're out working. You're out serving meals for Tim Fox in the parking lot. You're putting boxes in trunks. And everybody else is in here dancing. Let me put it in a house perspective for you. You were in the nursery taking care of the babies for the third week in a row. And you heard everybody in the auditorium getting on their worship and their praise today. And it was loud and it was fun. And, and, and Dave Wagner was in the room and he was releasing prophetic words. And woo, it sounded great. But I'm over here stuck in the nursery. That's the older brother. It got real, didn't it? I'm stuck over here, and y'all are having a party out on the dance floor. And now I'm angry because I've been working and working and working and working and serving and working, and I stuck it out, and I didn't go squander all my stuff, and I didn't go waste all your money, and I didn't go and steal and, and do all these things that you did, but now you're getting celebrated, and I'm still working. That's some people in the room today. So he called over one of the servants and said, what's going on here? The servant replied, it's your younger brother. Woo! He's returned home and your father is throwing a party to celebrate his homecoming. And the older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him, come and enjoy the feast. Come on, man. Come and, come and enjoy this with us. Come and partake in this. And the son said, Father, listen. How many years have I been working like a slave for you? Did he call himself a son? No. Because even though he stuck it out, he felt like he had a heart of a slave. Performing every duty you've asked as a faithful son. And I've never once disobeyed you, but you never threw a party for me because of my faithfulness. Never once have you even given me a goat that I could feast on. I'm not sure why anybody would want to eat goat, but... And celebrate with my friends like he's doing now. But look at this son of, of yours. He comes back after wasting your wealth on prostitutes and reckless living. And here you are throwing a great feast to celebrate for him. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me by my side. And everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to celebrate this and be overjoyed because... This brother of yours was once dead and gone, but now he is alive and he is back with us again. He was lost and now he is found. I want to give you three things. You need to return your heart. You need to reach out your hand and you need to remember your name. I'm going to put it in the microwave, those three things. Some of us in this room, you need to return your heart to the place that God had for you. The prodigal came to his senses. He realized the enemy is a liar. He realized I'm in a mess. He realized, oh my goodness, I need the house. He will wake you up on the inside, and if you will let him, he will bring your pride down 
and he will bring you back to the house. You've got to realign your heart. There's a seat at the table for you. And like I said earlier, pride can't keep you in the pigsty. And the older brother, he needed to reset his heart. He needed to return his heart because he was angry. He was fed up. He was taken for granted. He was annoyed at changes being made that he had no control over. Tim Fox. <clears throat> I'm saying that because he was put in a position that I had no control over. Wow, Angela, that's intense. Don't you love Tim? Yes, I love Tim. But none of y'all have to work for him. That's all I'm saying. No, he absolutely is in his exact place God's designed him to be. If anybody's building the church right now, it's Tim Fox. I can tell you that. But the older brother also needed to come to his senses. And that's a heart change. The musicians can go ahead and come. That's a heart change. Listen, you've got to come back to the place of your first love. You've got to come back to that place. Don't take the exit ramp. You got to remember the place in the house. Some of you, I pray, that are listening this morning, this may be the place your marriage got restored, that your body got healed, that your relationships got made right, that you renounced a habit in your life that God took away in a moment at this altar. We got to remember the place of our first love and the place where He delivered us, where you found life again, where God healed you. Why would you run from that place? Why wouldn't you run to that place? This is why the father said that he was dead and now he's alive because his son had to be resurrected. We got to return our hearts to a place of not judging, to a place of no cynicism and no criticism. And we've got to align our hearts with a place that says, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. We've got to drop our pride. And, and the older brother and the prodigal both had to come to their senses. And they had to destroy their pride. The second thing you've got to do is reach out your hand again. 10% of this house we call Jubilee Church cannot do 80% of the work. We need you. We need you. We need you. We need people on, on cameras for people who can't come here. We need people at our soundboard that want to help so you can hear and you can enjoy hearing voices and instruments and, 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 and an atmosphere where you can worship God with all of those comforts. We need people in our nursery. We need people with our preschoolers. We need people in Jube Kids. We still have three musicians up here. And we should have a full band, and we don't. It's time to reach your hand out again. The prodigal had taken all the encouragement and all the help and everything, and then he took it and left. And when he was in crisis, he came back. The older brother was doing the work, but with no passion. We have to reach our hand out again, and sometimes we don't want to help the ones who have left and returned. Are you listening to me? Sometimes we don't want to help those because we're a little condescending that you came back at the 11th hour and, and you get the same pay. God didn't ask that. There's resentment. God wants to deal with resentment and he wants to restore desire to live beyond your own opinion today. Come back. Come back. And the last thing is, some of you need to remember your name. Angela, I know what my name is. No, you've forgotten the name just like the prodigal did. He, he forgot he was called son. He forgot there was a son connected to his name. Son, daughter. Listen, you can walk in these doors as a spectator, as a visitor, or as an inspector. But we don't need any more house inspectors. If they do this, then I'll do this. If they change this, then I'll stay. If they change this, then I'll give. 
The Bible doesn't say any of that. We don't need house inspectors. We need sons and daughters. Inspectors are hired help. We need sons and daughters. Dylan, you're a son. Adam, you're a son. Quan, you're a son. Michael, you're a son. Mary Lynn, you're a daughter. Ashley, you're a daughter. God, help us remember our name. There's resurrection. You aren't an outcast. You aren't a servant. You're family. How does family act? They act like it's home. They act like my eight-year-old. When she walks in the door, her book bag drops in the middle of the floor. She runs over to get something out of the refrigerator. The refrigerator door stays open. She runs over here and does this, and then she throws her shoes off. She's outside, no shoes doing cartwheels in the front yard and nothing's been done. You know why? Because she's at home. Come on, just stand up with me. I know I've gone a little bit long today and I apologize. Actually, no, I don't apologize. Y'all need to hear the whole word. <laughs> but I believe today that there are dead things coming back to life. And one of the main places God said, I need you to return from is he said, Angela, I need you to return out of this place called numb. Because when you're numb, things feel dead. Where I had surgery from cancer, I can't, I have no feeling in this arm, under any of my arms. I'll never have feeling there again, it's numb. You know why? Because the tissue is dead. That's what numbness will do to you. But there's resurrection in the room today. There are prodigals. Some of you may be sitting in this room, but you're a prodigal in your heart. And God says, come home today. The Father is for you. He will run to meet you. Don't, don't worry about people. People will fail you, but God never fails us. Maybe you're the older brother and you've been here and you've stuck it out. And there's something in you that says... I'm not sure I'm in the right place. I'm not really passionate, but there's not too many people left. I better stick it out. You gotta come back with passion. You gotta let God realign your heart. You gotta come to your senses and find your passion and come back to your first love. Come on, everybody just close your eyes. I want them to sing this song and then we're gonna pray for you. Come on, y'all. Turn up the vocals. Start our hearts in the room. If that's you today, if you're one of those two, I want to pray for you because I believe there is a prophetic restart in the room today. There is a restart for your heart where you haven't felt that passion, you haven't helped felt your heart beating. Or maybe you still feel like you're not worthy or you're undeserving. Jesus gave his life for you. You're deserving. 
He loves you without apology. He loves you without conditions. If that's you, I want to pray with you. I know this is a strong and a brave thing to ask you to come forward for this. But I can tell you right now, I've been the older brother. <laughs> and I've had to ask God to return me to a place where I was passionate about his house. And I've come to this place over and over and over again. Who is with me today? Come on, if that's you, I want you to join me down here. God, I pray there is resurrection and there is refocus in the room right now. God, I pray that you would let us come to our senses. Let us come to our senses. Let us lay down our pride of what was or what has been or what could have been or what's been good and what's been bad and what's been done right and what's been done wrong. But God, today we come back home. We come back home. We come back home to your house. We come back home to a place, God, that we belong because we're sons and we're daughters. We're sons and daughters. Come on, who else is going to come back home with me today? I know I'm taking a minute. It makes you feel like, like you're not here, but I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that your heart hasn't been here, but maybe you just need a restart today. Because this is the moment where dead things are about to come back to life. Numb places are about to come back to life. Just going to give you a minute. Come on, I want somebody standing with every person up here. With every couple, with every person. Because that's what family does. That's what family does. We come and we embrace and we surround and we put the seal of sonship and daughtership on, on you today. You can call this place home without any limit, in, inhibitions, without anything in the way. Because here's where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart beating again. Here's where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart beating. Something is restarting right now. Here's where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart beating again. It feels so good to know. That's what family does. That's what family does.
are returning. We are returning. We are returning. We are returning. Come on, this is what's happening today. We are returning back to our first love. We are returning. We are returning. We are returning. Back to your house, oh God. We are returning. We are returning. We are returning. Come on, if you're at your seat, just raise your hands and declare that as a house. We are returning. We are returning. Yes, we are God. We are returning. We are returning. We are returning. Where the dead things. Here's where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart beating again. Here's where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart to know that you are with us, God. God, let our hearts beat so strong for your house and for this city. God, we cannot win what we do not love. We cannot win what we do not love, God. Let us fall in love with your house. Let us fall in love with your family and one another. Let us fall in love with our community all over again. We are your first love, God. Take us back to that place. Oh, yes, because we are returning. We are returning. Yes, we are, God. We are returning. Oh, back to that first love. We are returning. Back to your house, oh, God. We are returning. Returning. Oh, let this be a comeback day we for you. Oh, we are returning to your presence, God. We are returning. Come on, where are you returning back to? We are returning. Come on, get off the exit ramp today. We are returning. We are returning. presence of God in the room. I feel the presence of the Father. The Father is for you. The Father is for you. The Father is for you. I don't know where you are in your life, but if you think nobody is for you, I want to remind you that the Father is for you today. He's waiting for you. He is for you. God bless you. If you need prayer for anything else today, if you need us to pray over your physical body, if you need us to pray over a relationship, something else, a need in your life, come forward. One of us will pray, pray with you. But take this with you today. Let this be a week of returning to your first love. Amen. God bless you.